welcome to those of you who have kind of arrived in through the doors, so to speak, um, to this, our third Coburn conversation that kind of forms part of the annual Edinburgh Doors Open Days. Um, and it's a really kind of exciting kind of year for us because this is the 30th year. It's quite extraordinary that the Coburn Association has been organ organizing <clears throat> Doors Open Days in the kind of city. Um, and today is extra special because we've launched kind of a new website where you'll find all of our digital material on. So, you know, do go kind of experience kind of that, just Google in coburnassociation.org.uk doors open days and you'll kind of, kind of find all the information for a really spectacular virtual event of over 70 venues on this kind of weekend who produce some brilliant digital content. Um, at the very heart of doors open days is providing the opportunity to people to get behind the doors of places they don't usually get a chance of getting into or of getting in behind a door to find out something that they were unaware of. And it's in that spirit that these Coburn conversations take place, where kind of this year, um, for all of the events that we've kind of seen globally, we're looking at the kind of hidden and at times contested history um, of this kind of great city of ours. Um, now, we're using kind of Zoom for, and for those of you who have attended Coburn events in the past, you'll see some slight kind of changes. It's a webinar package, which means that your video and microphone will be disabled for the duration of the events. But what you can do is if you have a question um, you want to kind of put to, to kind of Lisa or to, to Professor Haig, you can use the Q&A kind of function or the chat function at the kind of bottom of your toolbar. And indeed, we would encourage you to, to kind of put, put in some questions. Um, and for those of you who um, wish to tweet, please do so. Use hashtag Coburn Conversations with a capital C and two capital Cs. Um, and in terms of all of this, please make sure that you respect the views of kind of others. Um, we will be kind of broadcasting this live on Facebook and we'll be recording it for future prosperity. Um, so if you have to dodge out for whatever reason, you'll be able to catch up at another time. Uh, and of course, I would ask, you know, if you enjoy this kind of event, if you participate in others or looking forward to this weekend's digital extravaganza, um, please give a thought about the effort it takes to kind of organizing it and consider becoming a member of the Coburn Association or at least even considering leaving us a small donation. We would most appreciate it and every penny goes to help us in our work of preserving and enhancing the amenity of this, this fine city. So without any further ado, you don't want to be listening to me. Um, I'd like to kind of introduce our, our conversationalist for this evening. Uh, as usual, our chairman, Professor Cliff Haig. Um, we'll be joined tonight by Lisa Williams, who's the director of the Edinburgh Caribbean Association. Um, Lisa has an MA in Arts and Cultural Management, is an honorary fellow at the Department of History. And that's kind of all the clues I'll give you um, kind of about her. Uh, and without any further ado, over to you, Professor Haig. Thank you, Terry, and uh, special thanks to everybody who's uh, uh, watching this evening, and particularly, of course, to those who are COBA members. Uh, and uh, very glad to welcome along Lisa Williams. Very grateful that she's given the time to to uh, take part in this conversation, which I'm really looking forward to. It follows the couple of us we've already had this week, and anticipates two more that follow on um, Thursday and Friday. So, Lisa. Um, can you maybe start off just by telling us a little bit about the Edinburgh Caribbean Association and your role in setting it up? Sure. So I just want to say thanks so much for um, inviting me and welcoming um, me tonight um, so we can have these conversations. Um, I set up the, Car the Edinburgh Caribbean Association about four or five years ago. Um, there's obviously been similar organisations before, but what I had found that there wasn't anything very active happening in Edinburgh at that time. I kept meeting people who were very isolated and people actually from all sorts of different countries across the Caribbean who'd been here maybe for 20 years and hadn't really met anyone else. Um, so really it was a social thing to begin with. And then also something because my mom's from Grenada and I'd lived in Grenada for almost 20 years. I had my two kids there and bringing them to Scotland, um, trying to find other people, but also um, wanting to really share Caribbean culture in Scotland as well. So we put on all sorts of events from everything from poetry to live music, to dance, to um, cooking lessons, and then the history as well. So once I started um, doing these back history walks of Edinburgh, and that's been coming up to about three years now, two, three years, 
um, really starting to integrate this into the school visits too. So um, getting together with the young people in smaller groups and then getting the young people, but also the teachers to understand the depth of Caribbean history. Um, and it's something I was very much inspired by Sir, Sir Jeff Palmer's talk that I went to a few years ago. And then I got involved in a program, um, the Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights across in Glasgow and the Africa Emotion Film Festival. And they put this amazing program together called Recovering Scotland's Black History. Um, and obviously it's something that people have been studying for a long time. So they've got people like um, Dr. Jean Evans from Guyana, who did an amazing thesis, PhD thesis in the 90s, looking at the African Caribbean presence in, in Edinburgh. So um, really following on from some of their work and then looking at the, the tours that had been going on in Glasgow. And I was like, right, okay, something needs to, to happen in Edinburgh because there's so much history. And it's something that I had been very involved in in the Caribbean as well, like working in primary schools and secondary schools and being involved in those conversations in the Caribbean. So I was like, okay, let's try to bring some of that knowledge to people here who are walking around the city and not necessarily knowing what all those connections are with the people on the other end. So when you're looking at statues and when you're looking at buildings, it's just sort of bringing the, the Caribbean stories to, to Edinburgh. That's, that's great. And I think it really enriches the experience of the city to, to see these connections and to understand, as we have indeed over the last couple of nights, that the links that, that are often there that uh, put Edinburgh in an international context, not just a local context. But of course, in the end, the, the, the character of the city is really important to us and uh, mm. something that we, we're all um, driven by. So would you like to take us on a bit of a tour? Where, where should we start if we're going to look for uh, these kind of connections, do you think? Um, well, well I, normally I do start my tour at um, St. Andrew Square at Melbourne Monument. But one of the things I throw out to people, as we were saying just earlier, um, and doing talks maybe in the community, and I will say to people, how long do you think people of African heritage have been in Scotland for, or that we know that we have a confirmed presence? And sometimes people will literally say, oh, I don't know, the 1980s, 1970s. Oh, so we can have to go right back, about almost 2000 years. And looking at some of the, um, the African Romans who were here almost 2000 years ago. And you have the African emperor Septimius Severus who actually had a fort at Cramond Island. And that's not my specialty. That's not the area that I, I look at in great detail, but I think it's important for people to know that, you know, it stretches back at least as far back as that and maybe even beyond actually, um, to know that. And I think it's important for, especially Scottish children of African heritage to know that too, to have that sense of belonging. But it's also important, I think, for everybody to, to have that, you know, to understand that. Um, but when, when I do the tours, um, I wanted to link tonight's talk as much as I could, obviously, to the, the buildings that would be open during the doors open weekend. And that's something that I've taken my kids to over the years and been so excited about going into those buildings and getting to see what's inside, you know, for those two days and looking at the program and trying to cram as much as I can into those two days. Um, now, one of the places that we walk past, we start in St. Andrew Square and we walk along George Street. And there are many buildings there that are connected with the Caribbean, which you can find quite easily now through, um, you know, when you look on the, the compensation map that's done by um, University College London. So there's so many connections with the Caribbean right through the new town, you're walking along George Street, you're walking along Queen Street, um, and going down, you know, further into the new town. Um, one of the places that we pause at is the assembly rooms and for a couple of reasons, there's a few stories really that are connected with it, but two that are interesting. Um, there's a particular um, Scottish abolitionist and the Scots were overrepresented in some areas of the slave trade system, but they're also overrepresented um, amongst abolitionists as well. So that story is interesting to tell people on different sides of it. Um, and Reverend Ian White's work has been invaluable at looking at the, the Scot Scottish abolitionists. So you have this one particular man called um, Reverend Andrew Thompson, who was a minister of the Church of Scotland, who makes this speech in 1830. 
which is so it's almost like a bomb going off in the assembly rooms because it was that explosive and that powerful. But to give some, uh, some context for people who are not quite sure about where this fits into all of it, you have the slave trade, which legally ends, um, British slave trade, which legally ends in 1807. And then you have slavery itself, which ends in most of the British Empire um, in 1834. Really, we have to call that 1838. But that's a slightly different story that we will talk about in a moment. And I think often what happens in the media, people get mixed up with the end of slavery, end of the slave trade and the end of slavery. And you see that a lot, even in major newspapers. But of course, we've got an awful lot happening in those decades between those two dates. So this is where Andrew Thompson comes in in 1830. The Lord Provost and various other um, people in powerful positions are having a meeting to say, we're going to have still this, uh, this, still having this idea of not immediate abolition, but gradual abolition. So the idea is we will free children. So anyone born after 1831 is automatically free. And then we'll see what happens with the adults. We'll spend, you know, spend a bit longer. Um, preparing people for freedom and so on. Anyway, Andrew Thompson goes into the assembly rooms. He's sitting there listening to the speech. They expect him to agree. He gets up and he's absolutely outraged. And he said, this is really a disgrace. You know, like, how can you, how can you get rid of sin by degrees? This doesn't make any sense at all. And we have to have immediate abolition. There is no more excuse for it. So the Lord Provost is, um, really quite alarmed by what happens. He walks out of the, the meeting. There's a meeting that happens again about 12 years, um, sorry, 12 days later, where, and it's interesting because Coben himself, look, Coben is, is there for these meetings. And he says, well, I don't really see much difference between immediate and gradual. It's kind of the same, it's just words. Um, and this is what he says in, in actually in his journals. Now, in this meeting, um, Andrew Thompson, there's a supporter of his, which who stands up and says, um, let justice be done, whatever the consequences are. And he takes this a bit further in the second meeting where he basically says, look, I'm no friend of shedding of blood, but if it takes violence on the plantations in order for people to be free, then, then it has to happen. So anyway, people start to cheer. They end up renaming the society. They set up a ladies association, which is really key because you get someone like Wilberforce who's not keen on women getting involved in the abolition movement. And Scottish women in lots of places like Dundee and across in Glasgow and then in Edinburgh are extremely involved in the abolition movement and really quite, um, you know, they have a lot of influence in a lot of different ways. There's a petition that leaves Edinburgh soon after that by 25,000 people um, sign that petition. So a pretty big percentage, maybe about 15%, of the pop, 20% of the population at that point, 15% probably. Um, you have um, Thomas Chalmers, who as we know is the, the head of the Breakaway the Free Church, who actually preaches at one of his funeral sermons because the sad thing, he died in the following year, just a few months later, of a heart attack in the street. And he's actually buried in St. Cuthbert. So St. Cuthbert's Churchyard is one of those places that we also stop on the tour as well and sort of pay homage to him, if you like. Um, and that leads us on to the Ladies Emancipation Society. And when people are talking about how there are so few women, and so, I'm sure that Sarah Sheridan will talk about this when she does her tour this week, the fact there are so few women commemorated in the city, um, Quite a few women historians and activists here have been working for a, a long time to make sure that those women are recognised in some kind of way. And I think if people are thinking about maybe making new statues, there'd be contenders for that. So Ladies Emancipation Society, and we'll talk about them a bit more in a minute, they were also very much connected with Frederick Douglass. Now Frederick Douglass, African-American abolitionist, and statesman, and author, does all sorts of amazing things with the entire family. Um, now, the real experts on Frederick Douglass in this city, Celeste Marie Bernier and also Alistair Pettinger, who've done so much work on this, and they'll probably know a lot more about it than I do. But he makes a speech in the assembly rooms 
1846, when he comes over and he lives in Edinburgh for almost two years in Brunsfield, which is his sort of base for when he's doing his tour around the UK and Ireland and so on. And they put up a plaque to him, which I'm sure quite a few people know, a couple of years ago, where his descendants came over, um, some of the top global scholars of Frederick Douglass came, and it was a very emotional weekend. And I managed, I was very honoured to spend that weekend with um, that group of people. Now, one of the speeches he makes in the assembly rooms, and again, all of these meetings and speeches are so popular, they literally got thousands and thousands of people trying to cram their way into the assembly rooms and desperately trying to get a ticket because these people are such amazing orators. Now, he makes a speech in there about a man called Madison Washington, who has this incredible slave revolt on a ship called the Creole, which is going from Virginia to New Orleans. And he ends up basically taking over the ship and taking that ship across to Nassau and the Bahamas, where all of the enslaved people end up being free. So he tells that story. Well, one of the stories, one of the, his main rallying cry when he's in Edinburgh and in Britain in general is for Thomas Chalmers and the Free Church to send back the money. And what he says is send back the bloodstained money. And he gets together with two of the women from the Edinburgh Ladies Emancipation Society and they go across to Salisbury Crags and they carve out that into the earth and they make such a stir that everybody's talking about this and everybody's, you know, a lot of people in Edinburgh then start to become very concerned about the abolition in the US at that point. So, um, yeah, it's, it's amazing how when you start digging into the history of these buildings, I mean, even just probably about 20 or 30 of the, the buildings for the doors open weekend, I could probably look at them and say, oh, yes, there's a story with this one, this one, this one, this one. Um, and they all will interconnect, even over different time periods. That's, that's brilliant. And I think you convey the excitement that there must have been mm. in the assembly rooms that, uh, that, that on those evenings with people mm. cramming in, you know, cheek to jowl and... A brilliant speaker and uh, as we know um frederick douglas is a, a towering figure uh, mm -hmm. and um you know my my granddaughters in chicago know all about him um and there was this exhibition in in the national library i think wasn't it, right. years ago yeah they did produce a map if yeah. I remember rightly but i don't mm -hmm. know what's, what's happened to those i don't know if we've still got any that uh, that people could follow yeah and, and it is one of the the rare situations where there is some physical commemoration on the building mm. i think isn't Absolutely. it as well? yeah and his family was so touched by that as well you know you can actually get the national library of scotland still on, online they still have it there available yes yeah, so um, i recommend that to people mm -hmm. who want to follow up on this the it's a great story and mm. a really significant figure Definitely. I, I must admit, I never realised the assembly rooms played such a was such a focal point in the the abolition movement. Mm. So let, let's carry on with your tour. Then, where do we go to next? Oh, where do we go? We get to Charlotte Square. I don't want to give it all away, but we get to Charlotte Square and we have a quick look at, at Butte House, especially people that are not familiar with Butte House. Now, the history of Butte House is something that again you can find quite easily on their on their blog. Um, there's something that Nicholas Sturgeon talked about last year, the launch of Black History Month at Scottish Parliament. And she talks about how it's really important that we look at parts of history that maybe we, we don't feel so proud about in Scotland. And she, she um, referenced the fact that the first few owners of Butte House all had plantations in Jamaica. So, and again, that's nothing unusual in that particular area. When we walk down George Street, I get people to look at different buildings like number 63 belonged to a slave plantation called Lewis Cuthbert, um, number 91, uh, 113, you know we throw out these numbers so when people are walking they can have a look for themselves and see if there's any difference perhaps with those buildings and others, imagine what it would have been like. Um, and I will tell people about some of the links, some of the, the money that people were transferring from places like Jamaica to maybe promote Highland culture back at home. So um, supporting the Highland Society, for example, putting money into the Inverness Royal Academy, 
and you see a lot of the money showing up in different educational institutions. Um, but at the beginning of the tour, I sort of, you know, I have to sort of lay out the general framework so that people can get an understanding of how long Scots have been involved in slave trade system. So we're looking at David Alston's work, you're looking at places like Suriname and South America. This is where I normally bring out a map for the Caribbean so people get an idea of where is where. Um, but even going as far back as the 1670s, I'm trying to get people to understand that Scots weren't just overrepresented in some areas of the British Empire, but also involved in places like Dutch Caribbean, where they also received some compensation money. And we're going to 1863. Also places like Cuba, 1868 is when they abolished slavery. You then get Scots getting involved in, in Brazil. And that's something that maybe hasn't been looked enough at enough um, in British historical scholarship because the links with Brazil are really, really strong and that props up the British economy quite um, seriously. And they don't, and they don't abolish slavery until 1888. That's really not that long ago. I mean, it doesn't seem that long ago to me. You know, 1888. Um, and then you find that the Scots were involved in mining places like Brazil um, where they're using enslaved people to work those mines. So it's a much bigger story than people think. People are just starting to get to understand the role in the British Empire. We could start looking at all those other empires as well. So it's a really quite complicated story. Yes, it's amazing to think as you walk along places like George Street that you're following the footsteps of people who had these slavery connections mm -hmm. that are so widespread. Yeah, that's it. And then, um, and the other thing I think is sometimes difficult for people to understand is that it wasn't just the elite that benefited, even though obviously it's going to entrench the class system, it's going to make some people much more wealthy than others, and obviously working class people also suffering here to a degree as well. But we also need to understand that a lot of the employment here was on the back of enslavement in places like America and in places like the Caribbean, where, and also the Caribbean's providing markets for things like coarse Osnaberg linen that you can't sell in Scotland or Europe very easily, but you can send that linen out to both enslaved people on plantations. And because of that ready market, the linen industry develops because that market is there. And the linen industry is subsidized at some point, we're looking at sort of mid 18th century, and it's subsidized not just to help develop the linen industry itself, but you have things like the whiskey and the rum industry developing on the back of it. So it's a deliberate strategy. If you're sending, if you're exporting um, Osterberg linens to places like Virginia and Jamaica particularly, you then, that same ship is gonna be bringing back um, things like, um, bringing back um, different products as well. So the whole, the more you look at it, the more you start to see it, really, and everything. Um, and of course, bringing in slave produced goods from America, so even after the War of Independence, you know, for a long time, we're bringing in slave produced cotton, which is going to places like New Lanark, um, and that's somewhere that's been looking at their history. Um, we're going to be talking about a tiny island called Karakou, which I used to live on, which is just off the island of Grenada. And we go actually down to a graveyard where we talk about the story of a woman who was from there. And even cotton from that tiny island, that's about three miles by five miles, ends up in places like New Lanark because the quality of the cotton is so high that it's very sought after in the textile industry here. So things like that. So yeah, we wander, we wander down from Charlotte Square and then we go down into the um, graveyard of St John's Churchill, and that's where that particular um, gravestone is. Now, the, the Edinburgh's Ladies Emancipation Society, one of the figures, Priscilla Grant, is actually buried in St Cuthbert's just behind that um, graveyard too. If we have time, sometimes we go down there and we look at it. Um, and it's important, I think, to really remember how influential that society was. So these women, all Quakers, and again, you see the kind of crossover from the Church of England then to the Quakers, which I think really interesting. So you've got Andrew Thompson in Church of England encouraging these same Quaker women to get involved in the movement. And they become so influential, they end up helping Frederick Douglass, they also help um, people like Harriet Tubman, the Underground Railroad. And one of the things that people find very touching on the tour is the, the stories of 
these Edinburgh women who get women all over Scotland to sew outfits for women who were trying to self-emancipate in the, the Underground Railroad. So you have that kind of solidarity across nations. Um, and what's interesting about them, which is a bit different from the, the suffrage movement in the US, is that the women here said, we will deal with abolition first, and then we will start to look at our own female suffrage. So once that's done, we will then you know, put the spotlight on our struggle. But the two are very intimately connected because those women went on to be the kind of forerunners of um, the suffragist and suffragette movement here. So they're so interesting, and I think they definitely should be honoured. And th that's again yeah, fascinating. And and when you when we th these graves that you're talking about, I mean, are they yeah. uh, are they kind of showcased? Are they, is there is there are they well maintained? Have they got um, you know something some interpretation connected to them? No, or, not yeah. Around? I mean, they are they're very well maintained um, and easy to get to. Now, actually, I only find out about the woman from Karakou when I first, I mean, I've been in nearly 10 years, about nine years. And when I first came, I went to the cafe with a friend and they had a little card on the table. I think it was more for children. And it said, there's a woman here buried, um, buried in the graveyard who's from the West Indies. Can you go and find her? And I was like, who is this? So I was really intrigued, went out. And there's actually a few people from Grenada buried in that churchyard. So I went scouring around and asked them to help me to show me where it was. And I felt so, I felt this very strong personal connection because she was, and it says very clearly on the gravestone that she's from Karakou. And I've lived in Karakou and I've lived on the same area of Karakou where she was from. And I know it really well. You can walk in that islands of Karakou and you can still pick a little bit of cotton, some of those trees. You can pick some of the limes where my mum used to live on a particular area picked those limes which ended up in Leith and ended up as part of the Rose Lime Cordial Factory the first 20 years they used to bring it in from the Caribbean. So these, these very tangible connections where you walked in both places and you can kind of fit the two together is really quite, uh, quite it can be quite an emotional thing. And I've also been in contact with, um, so the last couple of days I've been in contact with a lady who is descended from the family that this particular lady called Malvina Wells from Carrick, who worked for and lived in Edinburgh until she was 84. And she's been telling me all sorts of exciting things um, the last couple of days. Now, I'm also friends with somebody who's descended directly from Malvina Wells, who's from Grenada. Um, so we're now starting to sort of piece things together and have conversations with each other and people that descended from the two sides, which I think is so exciting. And one of the, the again, when I do the, the tours can be very emotional. For people for different reasons and I warned people before we start off I said look this is going to be an emotional journey I don't do it to be divisive I do it for truth telling I do it for understanding and I do it to bring people together and when we can have a mature conversation where we're informed then that can only be helpful and only be progressive but I do warn people that it will be quite emotional because you can't really talk about this history with going into some quite horrible things I mean you can't um, but you do have to be prepared for that as you go along the way. So when we get to this particular graveyard, I talk a little bit about Melvina. I'll talk about her in a sec. But the thing is about Karakou, it's a really unique island because one of the, one of the, in all the horror of the transatlantic passage, the middle passage, and all of the dehumanization that happens to people along the way. One of the things that has left a legacy of a great deal of pain for people is if you have African ancestry in your family, I mean, and personally, I am descended from, one part of the family is descended from enslaved African people. There's another part of the family who are descended from, from white slave owners, you know? So I have to look at my history and for, you know, work through those kind of emotions as well. And it's quite a few Caribbean people who have that similar history as well for different reasons. So, um, Karakou itself is a tiny island, but when you go there, the African traditions are so strong that it really, you know, the, the music, the dance, the food, the spirituality that people have managed to hold on to is one of the very few places in the African diaspora where people can say, 
I know I'm a Shanti because I'm descended from my grandmother's a Shanti, so I know I'm a Shanti, you know, from where what is now Ghana. People say I know I'm Temne, I'm I know Kramanti. They'll do particular dances or they will be very familiar with a particular drum rhythm which goes with that particular ethnicity. It's very difficult to hold on to your culture when you've been through this kind of process, which is all about stripping your culture away. And I think Scots can some Scots can identify with that on some level, you know, where people weren't allowed to speak Gaelic, for example, and Tartan was banned, and those kinds of things where I think sometimes people can have sort of some sort of empathy for some of that experience. Obviously, it's much more extreme and it's a whole, a whole different category, but it's that idea of deculturization to, um, to control people. So, but when you go to Karakou, people have a very strong sense of, of who they are which is amazing. Um, and what happened about four years ago is that the Temnic people from Sierra Leone went out to Karakou and met up with their Temnic counterparts. And they spent a week or so together going over the language and music and the dance and the spirituality, making those connections. So you see the Caribbean very much linking up again with West Africa now. And whether that's flights, whether that's trade, whether that's um, just making connections and having conversations. and you know, creating those those bonds again, which is is amazing. I think that, that's interesting because you know we've been thinking this week, particularly I guess, of the connections between Scotland and and the Caribbean. But mm -hmm. there's actually this third leg in the as in well, the yeah, just as it was, of course, in the in in the uh, slave era. That's uh, the, it. It was this triangular relationship and the the relationship between Scotland and West Africa, and particular West Africa. Um, again, is is not something that we're very aware of. I think, and yeah, yeah it's, it's really, really is there. Also, I think that story very interesting. That you know, the the inspiration came from this um, thing for the kids to do while mums and dads are having coffee. Um, and there's probably a message in that in terms of how we can reach out to mm. the young people who will then mm -hmm. take, uh, take their parents along uh, and, and their guardians along to, uh, to actually see these things. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm conscious of time and we're moving on. So sure. let's uh, discuss a bit about monuments. Where, where mm -hmm. do we stand on that? What's, sorry, did you ask me a question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, do you want to sort of say something about monuments? Oh, okay. Because that's, yeah, that is the conversation. I mean, to be honest, it has been the conversation in some quarters for decades. And it's only now with what's happened this year. Um, I think the conversation's definitely sped up the last year or two. And of course, with the Black Lives Matter movement and what's happened this year, it's brought it to many more people's attention. But for example, in Bristol, people have been talking about it for decades. And this is why what happened with the Colston statue. And I think it shocked a lot of people who didn't know about how many decades people have been talking about it. And it was quite a shocking incident for, for a lot of people. Now the statues, I think you see a lot of toxic debate around it on social media. People are becoming very polarized. And I think that's been happening in a lot of different spheres the last year or two. It's got particularly bad this year. I think sometimes some of it is a manufactured culture war, um, which isn't very helpful. Sometimes we can't have a very mature dialogue around it, which I wish we could, because there are so many things that we could do. It doesn't have to be leaving a statue or putting a plaque on the statue or taking down the statue. There's so many more things that we could potentially do. I think it's really important that we have young people involved in this conversation as well as older folks like ourselves. Um, because they're, they're going to be the ones that are going to be living with the cityscapes for longer than we are. And I think it's good for us to have a balance of ages together. Now, people don't always look at plaques, but I think plaques can be very useful to contextualise. Once people really are interested, they will take the time to look at it. It's very difficult to know what to put on a plaque. We've got 200 words. I've been doing some work with heritage organisations and trying to sort of choose 70 words to put on a panel. It's really hard to do. Um, sometimes what might be appropriate for one statue is gonna be um, not appropriate for another. Um, so for example, if you, let's say the Melville Monument is, is disproportionately high, towering over the city. There's numerous things that you could potentially do with that. You could bring that down to a different height. You could have a, a, a another piece of art in response to him. 
you could um, you could do a lot of different artwork around that for, for a number of years. I'm not just saying that particular statue, but maybe a statue you'd like that. You could do a lot of, um, you can engage young people in um, talk, finding out about the history, doing the research, um, approaching it through poetry or dance or all sorts of different things. I think one of the most important thing is that we're having this conversation. And I think we mustn't let it derail from very important issues of actual structural racism that are still with us. We have to make sure that if we're talking about the statues, that it's always linked to that in some sort of way. Um, so it doesn't just um, become just the statues. Now, um, I was going to play devil's advocate. I might play devil's advocate now, actually. <laughs> Harried with the heritage organization. Now, let's say just, I think it's just good for people to open up their mind as to um, thinking about the, the different things you could do. So just to imagine Edinburgh, if it had no statues at all, none. If you woke up all morning and nothing was there, and you had the choice then to remake the city as you would want to, and maybe you would want to honour certain people, maybe it wouldn't just be one particular person, maybe it would be a group of people, maybe it would be a statue that conveys a particular idea. Um, it could be, you know, there's just so many different things that we could do. So I think it's important sometimes just to sort of go back to basics and think actually it doesn't have to be these two um these two sides it can be a lot of different things i think it's helpful if people understand the history um, before they make important decisions i think if we have a greater amount of people having these conversations you can have democratic decisions which means you get a lot more people on board sometimes people are very resistant to it and they just don't want to to hear that certain parts of the history which is unfortunate and sometimes um you do get situations in certain cities where, like Bristol, where people have been trying for years and then nothing actually she happens. So we have to make sure that I think our local authorities are accountable, but we ne don't necessarily have to rush into decisions. Because I think it's important the more people really have a mature understanding, then you can have really constructive conversations around it. So that's basically what I think. <laughs> that, that's a really interesting idea. I quite like the idea of giving people blank maps and saying, mm. uh, what what uh, statues do you want to put up? And I think mm. where as well is also yeah. Important. And where? Yeah. And how? And how high? So more generally, how do you see the way forward? Um, in particularly, you, you know, you've emphasised more than once the importance of schools and young people. Mm. So do you see steps in that direction emerging? Um, yeah, I do. Um, and when we've gone into schools what i what we find is that the teachers are generally very very keen they want to know more they tend to be a bit surprised that they don't know a lot of these things they they worry about not having the right resources to use and sometimes it's having the confidence to deliver this in the classroom as well because one thing having the knowledge is another thing to have the confidence to deliver this sensitively whether that's an all-white classroom whether that's a multicultural classroom probably particularly important if you've got a multicultural classroom because if you don't deliver it confidently and sensitively and able to follow up with the follow-up um, discussions um, or approach it in such a way that maybe the children of colour you know they need to make sure that they feel supported and they don't feel singled out feel like people are looking at them and have sort of strange conversations that can turn into bullying in um, the playground afterwards or you know for their social spaces all of those things have to be thought through very, very carefully so that um, the young people can have, again, have conversations where people feel comfortable and supported. Um, so, yeah, definitely, um, definitely coming into school. I think it's, it's much fairer for children across the board, all children, all young people, to have as much context and as much information as possible. Our teachers under a lot of stress and pressure, I know that they don't always want to have to say, or oh, look at a separate thing or another module. All of this stuff should be integrated into the curriculum as much as possible. Black History Month is a good start um, and finding figures that people can celebrate in the school, but also making sure that this is fully integrated, not just in history, but this could be through um, languages or geography or you know different subjects as well. Um, so yes, <laughs> you were going to ask me something else. 
Well, maybe at this point we'll hand back to Terry and see what questions have come in if so, you need to take those. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And that was a really, I, I could just listen to you talk and, and continue on a tour kind of around oh, the city for hours and hours. It was absolutely spectacular. And we've got a range of, of kind of people making comments. So two who have just come in and talked about, um, you know, how about Charlotte Stopes, uh, who promoted the women's participation as a statue and, and uh, somebody else was recommending Charlotte Carmichael as well as the first woman in Scotland to obtain a university qualification. So I'm sure we're going to pick up an awful lot of this mm -hmm. on kind of Friday with, with, mm, with, with Sarah, Sarah as well. Definitely. Um, there was a question at the very, very beginning mm -hmm. to come back where, where you had mentioned Dr. Jean um, and there was just a blank. Um, oh. and the person was wanting to know who it was for the purposes of a thesis. Absolutely. Dr. Jean Evans from Guyana, who wrote a thesis at Edinburgh University. Um, I think it was 1996, I think she wrote yeah. it. But, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> and... Um, there was a comment that came in again, just as, mm. as, as a comment, and somebody was asking if people could donate um, the stories with New Black Edinburgh stories, you know, to you for use. And, mm. and if they could, how would they go about doing so? If they want to donate stories to me? Yes. Okay. Clearly, clearly they're enthralled by the stories you're great. telling. So. That would be great. Well, my email, <laughs> my email is half of Edinburgh and half of Caribbean. So it's easy to remember. Edincarib at gmail.com. So people are happy to email me. I mean, I'd be happy if they did. Uh, about to set up a website. It's been a long time coming, but we'll all be in a proper website. And, we'll, and hopefully we'll have a discussion area where people can um, put things... I have a Facebook page called Black History Walks Edinburgh. So if a person wants to follow that, they can always get hold of me that way and they can put things up, we can share things that way as well. But that would be great. I think that's really important that we always make sure that when we have these conversations, wherever that we have a way of continuing easily afterwards. <clears throat> there was a question that came into the, the Q&A where um, somebody was kind of asking earlier with the, the National Trust for England, Wales, and Northern Ireland, to give it its kind of full title, was criticised for kind of jumping on the bandwagon mm -hmm. when it talked about colonial kind of kind of issues. Um, do you think right. that Scotland is more open to its racist or racial heritage being exposed, um, or are people here just arguing that the curriculum is too crowded and Black history isn't just relevant? Um, it's hard to tell, you know, um, because sometimes the people who are most vociferous are in the minority. You don't always know. I think as a mixed bag, I think there is definitely an appetite for it. I think I know. Well, obviously, people choose to come on my tours. But, you know, they come because they want to. They get the information. They say sometimes they have to completely review everything they've ever learned. You know, um, I think it's a mixed bag. I think that sometimes people feel a bit threatened by it, which is unfortunate. Um, but I think a lot of it is lack of understanding and also understanding how the past affects the present. Um, so I don't know. We'll see. I'm, I'm, I'm actually quite surprised by the reaction to the National Trials. I even tweeted a sort of sarcastic comment about it today. I'm actually really surprised. I mean, I'm kind of obsessed with heritage and history. I mean, that's my thing. Um, but I was really surprised that people were saying, oh, I don't want to know about the history and leave this stuff in the past. Well, surely if you're interested in history, that doesn't really make any sense. And you've got this amazing project they did called Colonial Countryside, and I know some of the people involved in it over the last few years. And it's been an amazing project with, you know, young children of, especially of African and Asian heritage. You've got so engaged in this, and they're going to be our, our future. And I think when the young people come, so I do quite a lot of stuff for schools, I work I've had two 12 year olds come on tours this weekend. Those 12 year olds were absolutely brilliant and they asked the most amazing questions, are so engaged. We've done stuff out in East Lothian where a 10 year old girl turned around to us in this wee school in East Lothian, well, no Caribbean kids out there. And she made the connection with what's happened with the Windrush scandal and connecting it back to the time of enslavement and making that connection herself. And she's 10. So I think we need to have a lot of faith in. And the youngsters, because they're exposed to a lot more things, they're, they're having conversations with young people all, all around the world now. So it's it's a different different times. Mm. 
<clears throat> you touched upon uh, in an answer to the, the next question a little bit. I, I thought the, the limes into the cordial factory in Leith was, uh -huh. was absolutely kind of fascinating, but we, we tend to kind of associate slavery and links to slavery um, with wealthy merchants and aristocratic figures. Mm. Um, but just how deep through all strands of society did slavery touch? Um, and thinking again, of Edinburgh society, really. Yeah, I mean, again, it's a mix. It's hard to it's hard to single at Edinburgh as a, as a whole. Um, like I said, there's some there is sometimes resistance. So, well, okay, there's a few areas of resistance that come up. One of them, and there's some historians here that are constantly on Twitter having to you know battle this out in a way because and again, it's just a lack of understanding. Perhaps people will say yes, but the Scots were slaves as well, and you explain to people, yes, Scottish people really did suffer and often people were kidnapped, forced into situations that they didn't want to be in and their lack of power and so on and land clearances and, and all of the pain that comes from that legacy. So it's important to understand that and to honour that. But it's also important to make the distinction between chattel slavery and being an indentured labourer. Day labourer. So if you're an indentured labourer, you are still considered to be a human being. And chattel slavery considered to be property. It's very, very different. You don't have legal rights. You're not, um, you're really powerless completely. If you're an indentured labourer, if you're lucky enough, I'm not always lucky, if you were lucky enough to pay that indenture off after three to 12 years, you're free and you can start to build wealth and you can start to, your children can start to inherit wealth. And the legacies that come from those two systems are really different. And that's something that's really important for people to, to understand, I think. It's not about minimising the suffering of people who were indentured labourers, but it's to show there is a distinct difference and legacies from that. Um, I also think it's important to know that in the past, there were so many people fighting, and it was ordinary people generally, who were fighting against slavery. And you have multi-racial working class movements of people coming together and fighting against this together even then. So, and you see that cropping up even after slavery ends in the 1860s. And you see quite a lot of Scots in, involved in that too. So it is important to remember that when we're looking at this history, it's not about putting a present lens on the past and saying, and every, you know, sometimes people will say, oh, yes, well, everyone thought that it was fine then, it was just of the time. It's not really true because there's so many people at the time who were resisting, not just in the Caribbean. And we think about wars of resistance going on over centuries on the continent, on ships, and also right across the Caribbean, which made slavery increasingly hard to continue with. But we've also got people fighting here, whether that's through I mean, Ladies Emancipation Society doing various different programs, or whether it's people um, actively getting involved in revolutionary movements here as well, and seeing the connections as well with um, people that are struggling in different ways, but some, you know, they, you can see the links between them as well. Fabulous, fascinating. Um, and I've got a multi-strand question, could okay. you, but, it, but you, you touched upon the Coulson statue in kind of Bristol. Uh -huh. um, and the question, one of the questions that it is, is why did it take so long in your view for that to result in, where, where it did result in with the kind of removal of the, the kind of statue forcibly and then ultimately by the municipal authorities and are, are there specific lessons that can be learned in Edinburgh and Glasgow and I guess other Scottish yeah. places yeah. about the contextualization of street names buildings etc and then the question kind of kind of ends with should the Melville monument come come down so, so three strands <laughs> um well I'm not I'm not from Bristol, but, and I don't know all the details about Bristol, so you probably have to ask someone who's been through that or lived there. But from what I know, um, a lot of African Caribbean activists particularly have been asking the, the asking Bristol Council for, for a long, long time to put a plaque, change a plaque, contextualise it in some kind of way. And that was ignored. It was ignored for, I don't know exactly why that was. I think people just weren't taken seriously. Um, I think we have to also be careful about the idea of some of these statues that people will, sometimes people say, oh, well, these statues are, are only offending a certain sector of society. 
and then people will jump on the bandwagon and say oh it's pandering to a certain element of people why should we change our, our environment and i think it's much more constructive for any of these conversations whether this is how you contextualize things in national trust or in other heritage organization museums or in our environment but it's really about what are we trying to remember what are we trying to commemorate and what are we celebrating whether we um are deliberately doing it or whether it was just still living with a hangover of what was from a couple hundred years ago and what certain people found important to celebrate at that particular time so i think for me my ideal situation okay let's say if i was in charge which i'm not my ideal situation was to set a period of time a fixed period of time not too short not too long maybe two three years and he said okay 2023 we're going to make a decision we're going to make a democratic decision city of edinburgh or wherever you decide you're going to do this and you make sure that people have an opportunity to be educated on the history and on the themes you're not forcing it on people but you're making the information available to young people and older people and community let's have these conversations let's have mature conversations about it and i think then you can have a very democratic decision which doesn't become really polarized. Obviously, some people, um, you know, you, not everyone's going to get the result that they want, but I think that this is going to be an ongoing process. Um, I think with that statue, the plaque, if it goes ahead, it looks like it probably will. For me, that's a first stage um, that people might have extra conversation about it and decide that they want to do something different obviously this stuff is going to cost money as well i mean that's part of it if you start changing street names it become become difficult because it's going to cost it's going to lead to a huge amount of expense but i understand the reason for people wanting to do it as well i think we mustn't be rushing into things but we also mustn't get to a situation like bristol where people are trying to get stuff done and they're being ignored and nothing happens so we must have a period where we're doing active things to be able to get this information out there, but not just letting it drag on, you know, forever, um, where nothing ever happens. <coughs> and I guess that kind of comes into this kind of wider question around the educational experience that you've, mm. you've talked about in schools and um, you know the kind of challenges and opportunities kind of exist, mm -hmm. um, but there's a there's a related question that a number of 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 uh, attendees have kind of touched upon in mm -hmm. in different bits. If I can try and summarise a number of them, but it's mm -hmm. it's also the kind of strategies that you'd recommend for adult education or engagement. I think you touched upon that in mm -hmm. terms of, but is it would it be a de dedicated um, you know commission or you know how how would you go about making sure that that increased knowledge mm. and awareness that you're actually contributing to to significantly mm. actually kind of land so that people can make those mm. educated yeah um, decisions i think it has to be multi-stranded um we do need to think about accessibility so we need to think about people who can't necessarily come on a tour for various reasons um to, so to make sure it's as accessible as, as possible in all different ways um, I think visits to schools can can be good I think what we're doing now is great you know these kinds of conversations where people can tune in but you can also have a recorded version where people can pick up on that at some particular point um, teachers have often off, often asked for reading lists um, there's plenty of information out there and good websites I think it's about finding pointing people towards um, reliable sources of information because we are living in strange times now where you know it's, it's difficult for a lot of people to sift out what's true and what isn't and what's um you know proper scholarship um so yeah multi multi-stranded but i think um okay like my tools for example i do charge for my tools but if somebody for example is unemployed or they're a student or it, it's a struggle for them to pay then i can make arrangements for them for example um, so I think it's about making this information accessible as possible in, in all, all sorts of different ways. Um, I, what I want to do, and one of the things that our organisation tries to do, is twin schools with schools in the Caribbean 
or for example, you could have James Gillespie's High School twinning with a school in Virginia, where we have the technology now, and we've seen during this lockdown with, with Zoom, we can have the most amazing international conversations extremely easily. So we're not just in this silo, we can think about transnational view of, of Scottish history. We can have conversations with historians and teachers and students from all around the world. So you can get their perspective. Because when I'm working in a primary school in the Caribbean, those kids know all about Sir Ralph Abercrombie. And they might not know about Dundas, but they'll know about the Scottish military figures who went out to the Caribbean. And they're eight and nine. So to be able to have those kinds of conversations, I think, would be great. <clears throat> Fantastic. And my... My colleague has kind of asked me to kind of ask the question as well of, you know, keep, you've got a huge kind of wealth of knowledge of this. So are you pulling it all together into a book that we can actually buy for Christmas? Whatever, well, whatever Christmas that's going to be. <laughs> whatever Christmas, that's the yeah, thing. Yeah. yeah, well, that's the plan. That is the plan. And that is, and I have had some interest as well from publishers. So it looks like it will be, will happen. Um, won't be this Christmas, but maybe next year. So it's in the Caribbean, please the Lord, next year, maybe. So, um, yeah, and even if we just put it together in small booklets, so it doesn't have to be a, a massive tone straight away. So Absolutely, because I know a number of, of kind of attendees have talked about books mm -hmm. like Black and British by, by David. David uh, Sugar, yeah. yeah. And and yeah. somebody else talked about The Love Song by Andrew, kind of, kind Andrew Levy. Andrew Levy, yeah, yeah, brilliant. So, so you know, there we go. I think you've, you've got a, a spot on the bookshelf for kind of all of that. Thank you. Uh, Thank I you. think your time is really kind of running away from okay. us. And, and we've covered a lot, but I think I've captured most questions that have come in. And apologies if you don't think I've done a good job on that. Um, but it's been fascinating. And clearly the kind of rate of questions and issues has been, been fascinating to those who've been listening to you. Um, but what I'll do is hand over to, to our chairman, Cliff Haig, to, um, to kind of sum up and then um, come back to me for, for, for closing down um, this Cuban conversation. But first, Cliff, over to you. Yeah, th thanks so much, Lisa, for so many insights and such creative thinking about ways forward. Um, just a couple of things strike me. It's impossible I think, to sum up all the things that we've said, but um, thinking internationally, some of the places I know. On street names, um, mm. in Eastern Europe, things were more or less changed overnight after 1989. Mm -hmm. You know, street names were, were, were the, the sort of first thing that, that mm. happened, even if, the, even if the plaques weren't changed, the, uh, the, the street names were mm. changed and that the plaques became later the... the, mm. the the, the, the name on the street. Uh, at the other end of things, um, you know, South Africa went through, if I can remember rightly, that the name of it, Truth and Reconciliation. Reconciliation Committee, yeah. And, uh, a very, very deliberative process mm -hmm. um, after the end of apartheid mm -hmm. uh, that, that tried to very consciously um, bring together very different, very, very, very antagonistic yeah. positions. Uh, I think with, with quite a lot of success. Mm -hmm. So I think the idea of some sort of um, process that that looks, that, that there is somewhere between those two, mm -hmm. in terms of, of a time period being set mm -hmm. and um, a, a, a conscious process of listening to diverse voices mm -hmm. uh, would, would be uh, something well worth thinking about. Mm -hmm. And in all of this, again, it, it strikes me that although we've been talking kind of culture and built environment and history. There's probably also an economic dimension, the way that Edinburgh handles mm -hmm. its relationship to the world mm -hmm. beyond here mm -hmm. and the world Definitely. within here, the, the world that's come to Edinburgh and the, 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 the Edinburgh that's gone out to the world mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is actually quite important in terms of the credibility of its brand. Yeah, it is, absolutely. And perhaps that's something that we've, we've tended to overlook even mm. this yeah. So thanks so much for being such a, a stimulating contributor to these these talks. And Thank you too. Tomorrow night to uh, Andrew Crummy, and I will be chatting about the Craig Miller Festival Society, where the whole role of people who were indentured into mining uh, is part of the origins of that story. Mm. We'll more about that tomorrow. So thanks again to Lisa. Thanks to everybody, not least the team in the in the Coburn who've made it possible. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, Cliff. And I'm sure all of our attendees, if they could be, will be applauding kind of kind of our conversationalist kind of tonight, which is 
uh, absolutely kind of, kind of fantastic. Um, a reminder that, as, as Cliff said, there's two more, more conversations you can book on Eventbrite for those. And as I said kind of earlier, we have now launched our Doors Open Days um, website with all of the virtual activities that you can take part in um, kind of over the weekend. So please have a look at that and, and kind of plan out your kind of weekend where you can go. So um, without any further ado, I think it's really just thank you both so much for our Actually, that, that most stimulating conversation. Um, and we look forward to keeping that conversation going, I think, is the, <clears throat> is the key message. So thank you very much. And thank you to those who've attended. Um, keep safe and all the best.